Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for February 13th, 2024. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles up between you and the life you want to be living. We explore the habits and behaviors that lead to clutter, and we suggest strategies to slow the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we decide to keep. If you're new to our Zoom meeting, we want to let you know that you can share your questions and comments via the chat, and I'll try to make sure Gail gets to them before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question yourself via audio or video, and we're streaming the webcast live on Facebook so you can share your questions and comments there, and I'll relay them to Gail. We're going to start by recapping last week's weekly tittle, which was called Procrastination Journal. The assignment was to spend some time paying attention to your experiences with procrastination. Let's hear from our participants in Zoom and on Facebook. Who kept a procrastination journal this week? Please let us know in the comments. I would really love to, to know if, any, if anyone did this one as we described it. I actually played with it a little bit myself, but not for very, not for very long. I, I, I think, I, you procrastinated yeah. on the procrastination journal. Yeah, M says sigh. I didn't get around to it, and I, 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 I'm curious whether that's going to be the answer for a whole lot of people. Um, it's it's the easy setup, right? Yeah. So you know, maybe, maybe we'll circle back. To this one next week maybe some people will try their procrastination journal <laughs> once a they, week late. once we've given them another tittle that makes <laughs> last week's tittle more appealing <laughs> okay an email correspondent who asked to remain anonymous had this to say on the topic of procrastination i'm already on the other side of painful procrastination she put that in in quotation marks i've had three sets of visitors staying with me and I've been on a vacation all in the last four weeks. I didn't have a lot of notice, but when I should have been focused on getting the house ready, I got distracted with things that didn't matter, like working on organizing craft supplies, paperwork, clothes, and kitchen stuff. I left the dreaded housework till last, then tried to get it done but couldn't. I ran out of time. The house was embarrassing. I was exhausted. I said never again. I made a spreadsheet sheet of priorities, and I'm eating the frog first, again in quotation marks. I'm keeping this note so I can see it every day. I forgive myself, but don't want to procrastinate on the important things like that ever again, starting over with a plan. <laughs> Being embarrassed because others have seen the state of your house is a surprising motivator, isn't it? As long as it spurs you to new action, instead of shutting you down completely and making you hide rather than do something to improve it. But thankfully, this viewer has made a plan. She had an unpleasant experience, did not enjoy that experience at all, and vowed to do differently next time. I love that she grabbed onto several of the points that we make. She made a priorities list. She's putting a note up to eat the frog first. She made a point of saying eat the frog first, and she's going to put that up so she can see it every day. And most importantly, she forgave herself for the experience she had, and instead she made a plan. So I want to say I'm super proud of you, viewer, for charting a new path here. And please come and tell us how it's going for you as you work the plan. We would really like to know um, how you execute the plan that you made and how you feel about it as you do it. So come and give us some more feedback. Thank you for sharing. It occurred to me that what she described was what we've referred to in the past as structured procrastination, which is when you have something that moves to the top of your agenda or to-do list yeah. and it's so difficult or painful or distasteful or boring or tedious or whatever that you look for something else purposeful to do instead and and so you know all the things she said she did instead Organizing the craft supplies. Good and worthy things that needed to be done. Yeah, yeah. Just not the thing that was that was really that pressing would support in the, the visit coming, right? Yeah. yeah like they, they were not going to help the visitors be more comfortable in the house. Yeah. You know, so I you know, I, I think she should 
feel good that she got all that stuff done. Be sure to celebrate mm -hmm. that. Celebrate mm -hmm. what you did get done because you could have been watching TV or <laughs> right instead you know, of working crossword puzzles. Supplies. Yeah. Connie says, uh, Connie, Connie's tittle report is no journal, but keen observation. I need an immediate reward to keep going. Oh, cool. That's a good thing to notice because then you can, you know, plan for that and hopefully um, give yourself some motivation that way. Lisa Beth says, son is in transition that is moving stuff out. CJ says, I didn't journal, but I stopped procrastinating on getting some things out of the house, clearing a clearing up a couple hot spots that were bugging me excellent and of course the secret of the tittle was to try to get you to think differently about what you're procrastinating on so if you stopped procrastinating without doing the tittle that also gets the job win done, right? <laughs> you win big right because the ultimate thing was you did something about um stuff in the house that was irritating you so good job and suzanne says i plan to keep a journal but i discovered that every time i plan to procrastinate and to write I asked myself the questions on the spot and went into action. Awesome. So isn't that interesting? So the trigger was asking yourself the questions. The threat of keeping a procrastination <laughs> journal <laughs> moved Suzanne to action. Awesome. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Whatever works. And it's great to know that if you can stop and ask yourself the questions, it will help you move forward. Like that's a way that you feel comfortable or feel moved to make act to take action so that's a good thing to know about yourself and to actively support paula says i ignored the tittle as usual and went full steam ahead took bags to the thrift store and more important tackled a box of mementos threw away a lot more than i expected excellent isn't that good yeah you know we don't care if you do our homework the ultimate goal of this is that you get into action and make some changes in your own environment and if that's what you did then you win the end <laughs> yay we're cheering for you linda says we're seeing signs of spring fake spring here in ohio <laughs> so i'm seeing my outside spaces and they are feeding my imagination now almost two years post house fire with my house built though not entirely finished the outside spaces are calling to me. That's my motivation for sorting through stuff yet again inside so I can enjoy playing in my outside spaces. Awesome. That's a good, you know, you, I, I love that it's fake spring because, <laughs> you know, you're up there where it's uh, colder for longer, right? So take advantage of the time that you're still stuck in the house and uh, try to get yourself um, ready, get some things done so that you're ready to then go focus on the outside. I like it. That's a good planning. And Naomi says, didn't think about procrastination because I had an atypical week, trip to Toronto for full days of meetings. So I can say I had a reason to defer the procrastination journal. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, okay. <laughs> we will support you in that. <laughs> uh, Jane says, I didn't get this done as described. That said, I worked through two boxes of photos and took out trash recycling and stuff that belonged elsewhere. I'd put this off for years. Thinking about why I procrastinated, I think it's because of fear of having to feel the emotions. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as bad as feared, one. and phase two should be fairly easy. Right? That's that's that whole uh, getting started and trying to take the first step because you're afraid of how bad it's going to feel. And good for you that you did it anyway, and you made some progress. And like I said, uh, our whole goal here is to help you get in motion. And so whatever worked... And it sounds like you learned something and that, yes, there's some emotion, but once you faced it, you were still able to make progress and you feel like it's going to be less of a burden next time. So good job. That's a good thing to figure out. Linda says, I pondered a bit on this topic. I'm not a procrastinator when there is a firm deadline. I run into problems when the deadline is vague or uncertain. Mm -hmm. This can be troublesome when the project is important, but the timing is unknown. For example, I need to downsize but when and how will that play out? I realize that my favorite clutter fairy, clear, clutter fairy advice works well for this type of situation. Do it while you have the capacity. Yes, so that's do, super important. Do the decluttering now and I'll be glad when and however the actual move occurs. I understand that completely. That And that's an important lesson that I need to keep learning. The, you know, you, you, 
have a day when there are no appointments on the schedule and you think this is the day I can get caught up on fill in the blank. all the blanks and then you just let other things eat away at it but you know do it when you have the capacity is a, and I think um you know recognizing that you intend to move or downsize like I had this conversation with a client recently she's like I think I'm going to move in the next you know, three years. Okay, well, cool. So you don't have an exact date, but you do have a three-year timeline here. So if we start working on this now, then everything that you do towards that goal is one less thing you have to get done when you've actually pulled the trigger. And frankly, I think that if you can get to a point where you feel like you're ready, um, then you can use having gotten ready as the trigger to pull to trigger. It's the fact that you're ready can be what makes you decide it's time to go. And so think of yourself as, like you said, do it while you have the capacity and also so that you're being kind to your future self and you're not having to spend all that time when it becomes necessary or when you finally decide it's time to go for whatever reason that happens. Um, you can easily pivot and be packing and be ready to go if you've done all this work in advance. And so you're trying to be nice to your future self as well so that the burden of moving is lessened by all of the work that you've already done. So even though there's there's a sort of a nebulous deadline out there, you can still be thinking to yourself, I want to do it while I have a capacity. I want to be nice to my future self and not wear myself out when the time comes. And so Everything that you everything that you put into it that you get done now is one less thing you have to do later when you're under the gun of the decision. And so go for it. You're doing a good job and it'll make a difference. Okay, one more comment. Um, CJ says, thanks to the tittle, I analyzed why I'm procrastinating. A lot of experts attribute, pr attribute procrastination to overwhelm, whether related to the task or just in general. So the procrastination is a form of pressure valve release in quotes, allowing us to let go of the stress slash pressure for a moment. So if we can make ourselves conscious of what's really driving it, then we can find a more constructive coping mechanism. Do I simply need to take a brief break to build the mental and physical energy to get started? Or is the overwhelm actually coming from mounting external obligations, pushing aside my internal slash personal priorities? She goes on to say, we are more motivated by our own priorities, even if they're stressful. So if I stop and ask whether that which I'm procrastinating on actually harmonizes with my personal pro priorities, then I find the motivation to either go ahead and start tackling it or to achieve my goals, or I make a conscious decision to delegate or drop responsibility for that looming task that doesn't work for me instead of simply ignoring it. Yeah, I have so many things to say about that, and I, but I'm conscious of the time. So yeah, let's let's actually... <laughs> Um, go on to the other bit about procrastination so that we can get on to today's topic. Okay. Um, this was a comment we received from YouTube viewer Wit7862 on the subject of procrastination. Wit shared a therapist advice that we thought some of our viewers and listeners might want to try. Wit writes, many years ago, my therapist working with me on anxiety and avoidance taught me that not taking action was in fact an action itself. She had me write a decision matrix, say, for making a phone call that I was dreading. What are the best and worst things that can happen if I make the call? And what are the best and worst things if I don't make the call? Then if I decide I can take the worst of not calling, I can decide not to call and not spend days of anxiety telling myself I'll make it in an hour, in another hour, tomorrow. It has been a helpful way of looking at avoidance procrastination for me. Thank you, Wit and Wit's therapist, <laughs> for sharing this technique. It's really a concrete way to handle this and to ad address the anxiety that we feel when we're procrastinating. If you're suffering from chronic procrastination, you probably find yourself stuck in avoidance and maybe feeling bad about yourself for both what you're doing and what you're avoiding. Why not try the decision, decision matrix suggestion? Write down the best and worst outcomes you can imagine from either doing or not doing the thing you're avoiding and see whether that action helps relieve your anxiety or clarify your way forward. And let us know how it goes. I really appreciate that the therapist, that he's sharing this therapeutic technique with us. It was, I thought it was really excellent. 
he or she, I'm not sure what. Wit, right. We're, uh, yeah, we're making that up. I don't yeah, know. We don't know, <laughs> I don't we know, don't the know answer. what wit 7862 is. Um, okay. Let's go into our main topic. Okay. We love the people in our lives and we also love our stuff, but sometimes our feelings about and behavior with regard to our clutter can create distance, conflict, or tension with people we care about. Today, we're going to examine the ways in which our attachment to stuff complicates our relationships and offer strategies for diffusing conflict and holding space for love. Tomorrow is Valentine's Day in the Western world. Uh, actually, I'm not sure who all celebrates Valentine's Day, but it's a holiday to celebrate love between couples. Given the that couple-centric moment, we figured it would be a good time to talk about how clutter affects relationships. And we put out a survey to ask about that topic too. We got some interesting stories in the survey results. So check out the link when we post it up to read everyone's survey answers. And let's start by looking at some of the results of the survey. First off, we're going to talk about the just for fun question. <laughs> we asked our audience to choose from among several options, the one that best describes your feelings about Valentine's Day. That's a long sentence. We're going to go in reverse order. And the number five answer at 5% was, it's a special day for my spouse to pamper and spoil me. And we're very sorry, ladies. We wish that number was larger than 5%. Uh, the fourth most popular answer at 10% was, it's a magical day for me to acknowledge the love I feel for my special someone. That's awesome. In third place at 13% was, it's a day right before the best discounts of the year on chocolate. <laughs> In second place at 50% was the most cynical response. It's a BS Hallmark holiday designed to sell jewelry, greeting cards, stuffed animals, and candy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know that. But the top response was other at 58%. So almost 60% of you said none of those things applied. <clears throat> and we gave respondents a chance to elaborate if they selected this option. One of our favorite answers was from Mikey. It's a mix of all of the above. <laughs> Some years I'm more positive about it and some years more cynical. Overall, I think it's a nice opportunity to share love with those we care about, if we wish. And the candy and heart decorations are a plus. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Mikey. I appreciate that. Yeah, a lot of people chimed in on um, how much fun the candy hearts are. Candy hearts are a popular favorite. We like our candy hearts, right? So uh, let's get on with the more serious survey topics now. We asked our audience to describe an experience in which clutter had a negative impact on a relationship. And Luz Maria wrote in 2021 and 2022, I lost out on $1,025 of my flexible spending account money as I couldn't find in my receipts. And then only to discover that I could have gotten duplicates of the same thing and submitted them before missing the deadline. But my anxiety was through the roof and I was just plain useless. I'm so pissed at myself. I'm sorry, Luz Marie. <laughs> I'm sure that feels like a big, um, you know, poke in the head. We had an anonymous responder who said, I avoided making plans if I thought people would need to come to my house. My house was in a location that it would have made a good meetup place. And it was so stressful to come up with an alternative meetup place. Sometimes it was just easier to pass on making plans. And oh, that's, that's sad, right? That's who wants to not have fun with your friends? Who wants to not meet people and uh, build relationships? And I'm sorry that it seemed easier to pass on making plans with people. That was a common answer. You know, it, it kept me from having people over. It kept me from making plans with people. And that's, that's the big loss, that loss of relationship, right? Yeah. That loss of connection. Mm. Uh, Kara wrote, a mother of children that I babysat when I was a teen stopped by our house. She tripped over some kind of clutter that was on the floor, and I was never asked to babysit again. <laughs> so that's that's like an immediate result of the mom saw the cluttered house and then didn't feel like she was a good babysitter anymore. And what those two things have to do with each other, I'm not exactly sure. Like clearly somebody can take care of kids, even though there's clutter around. But the mom made a judgment call there that this was chaotic. And so therefore this person shouldn't babysit my kids. Noreen wrote, my boyfriend's habit of taking over my coffee table every time he's here drives me crazy. <laughs> Beverages, medicine, wallet, keys, and food. 
Yeah. So it yeah, drives so, you crazy. And it's a perfect example of what we're going to talk about later. Well, and it's, I mean, it, it's in the, in this particular instance, it's sort of a sign of, uh, it's, it's like a sign of disrespect. He hasn't, he hasn't picked up on the fact that it makes you crazy. She has her, her she has her space a certain way and he's just, he's taken over this piece of it. He's made it, he's right. made it his he's, own when he's there. And he doesn't like clean it up after as part of the process or yeah. He, and he hasn't noticed that you're sensitive about it or that you're reacting to it, which is never a good sign. Right. Yeah. Sorry. We also asked our audience, how might reducing your clutter or making your home more organized affect your most important relationships or affect your health, happiness, well-being, attitude, or mood? Um, Cece wrote, a clean and tidy home helps me on all levels of relationship, from my faith to my physical and mental health, joy in my marriage and in my relationship with my kids. A tidy home helps me want to get out more and have company over. And that's one of the great results, right? You spend more time with people that you care about. We had an anonymous response that says, it's not good for a relationship when your home is a stress point, even before you start to think about home repairs, improvements, family visits, etc. It's hard to clean when there's so much stuff everywhere. And the existence of the clutter makes it hard to work together to make progress. Anything that reduces stress for both of us can only help the relationship. Totally true. Um, I have an a, a client where one of the couple has ADD and the house is really in total chaos because she has a hard time managing her ADD. The other spouse um, bought a second house to work in rather than try to cope with the chaos that's built up in their first home. And it's a very unique sol solution to coping with the stress. Like this is more that I can deal with. I'm going to go work in another house while you are here with this stuff. We have neighbors who are a husband and wife who live across the street from one another. And I, I, they've lived in that arrangement for a very long time. And I, wow. I don't, I don't know all the circumstances, but I know that very divergent styles of organizing are, are one feature of their relationship. So. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It just seems really drastic in general, but if it works for them, Right. Right. Then, it, you know, it solves the problem for them. It's a short walk. Right. <laughs> Across the street. You can yeah, have dinner together. I do worry about, they have a, a teeny tiny little dog who goes back and forth. Oh on, yeah. So then the dog's sort of like on I, the street. I do, wor do worry about her having to cross the street. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a so couple funny. Of, before we go on, a couple of people have commented on, on Noreen's answer about her boyfriend with the stuff mm -hmm. and and um and deborah said maybe he doesn't have another place for those things in your place mm. ginger said give the boyfriend a place to stash his stuff a tray or basket my husband did this too i put a wooden oval bowl on the table for his wallet and keys and pocket debris there you go so you're um a calling attention to the fact that you wish that it was different and then you're making a suggestion here's what you can do instead i know that you need um i need to accommodate that you want to put your things down and they need to be here and so here's the place where you can park them and that would be helpful so good job evelyn says less clutter should make it easier to focus on a healthier lifestyle i agree uh, it'll, it's easier to worry about what you're eating and how you're exercising and how you're getting in motion if you're not trying to work around a bunch of clutter. We also had another anonymous responder saying, reducing clutter and making my home more organized affects my relationship with my sons for the better. Bit by bit, it alleviates the mental burden and level of dread that they are expecting to deal with upon my death. It allows them and me to have more fun when we're together because it's so easy to get a meal going or to pull out a game to play. What a great, you know, like she's recognizing, they are recognizing that the organized house makes the kids nervous because they feel like they're going to have to, it's going to be a project for them. It's going to be the disorganized hassle. house. Yeah, 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 yeah. The disorganized house. And so she's addressing that and they're feeling better about it. And then they can have more fun, which is a lovely result. We also asked our viewers and listeners to describe an item that evokes a strong association or memories of a person that you love. And our audience came through with such lovely, touching stories about things that they keep to trigger those good feelings and memories. 
Um, please go back and look at all the public answers. Um, when you look at the survey results, they're going to be at cfhou.com slash results 201. Uh, we'll just share one favorite response amongst all of the ones that we got. And this one was from Kathy who wrote, my mother made each of us a Santa stocking out of felt when we were kids. Each child's stockings had a different theme. Unfortunately, the felt and cotton batting and other embellishments didn't stand the test of time. It took me a few years after she passed, but I finally just took a picture and put the stocking in the trash bag. I've never looked at the picture. I found I don't need it to, re as I remember the stocking when it was new and fresh and not looking like the mice had chewed on it, <laughs> which was great. Thank you for sharing that one, Kathy. And there's several others in there of things that people, um, special, special items that people remember their loved ones by. And so it's a good list to read. As always, thanks to everyone for sharing their excellent stories with us about clutter and relationships. The funny thing about this topic is that after we picked it, I got a call from a freelance writer for U.S. News Real Estate, who is writing about the same idea, what makes moving in together hard. She wanted my one thought about it, and I knew immediately what to tell her. Uh, more on that later. I've talked about Client Zero here so many times, with their permission, of course, and when I started working with them, they had been married for many years. They've been living in ever-growing stacks of stuff until the piles were about shoulder high with some goat trails walking through them. And the husband of the couple had finally reached his limit. <clears throat> I think it was the height of the piles that ultimately got to him. He was really bothered by it at this point. And, and the wife called me to help them because she truly believed that if she couldn't figure out a way to get under control, they were going to get a divorce. She herself wasn't really bothered by a chaos and didn't want to do anything about it at all, but she very much wanted to stay married. She absolutely loves her husband and was willing to do whatever would keep him happy. Their relationship is the perfect example of what I told a freelance writer about couples moving in together. I told her that every person in a relationship has a threshold of stuff that feels overwhelming to them and no one marries their exact match of that threshold. So each person in a relationship has their level that triggers anxiety, distress, and overwhelm, and that makes them start to clean up and clear out the chaos. And even if you have a similar tolerance threshold, you'll be triggered by different elements of the chaos. So one person is triggered by the stacks of mail, while another person flips out about the pile of shoes. So someone reaches their limits first about a specific category of stuff. While one person generally hits their trigger point first, one person of the couple usually has a lower threshold than the other partner, and it's a permanent discord between every couple. The person with the lower threshold reaches their limit first, then they start to freak out, and they complain, and they get angry and frustrated, and they start their mad reactionary cleaning process. That usually involves throwing some stuff out, <laughs> <laughs> packing things up, hiding things away, and giving things away in a very disruptive manner. So I want you to think angry bird here. Angry Bird is cleaning up. The other person in the couple has not reached the limit where they become stressed because their partner usually reaches their limit first. So the other partner, the non-triggered one, is wondering what the big deal is. Why is my spouse flipping out? What gives them the right to throw my stuff away? There's not too much stuff here. It's not that bad, really. So why all the drama and the upset and the yelling? And if that spouse has the poor judgment to say any of this out loud, <laughs> you can bet that the angry bird goes nuclear at that point. So as long as these two people are together, the lower threshold person reaches their limit, gets super irritated about it, yells at the higher threshold person to start cleaning up. The higher threshold person never has a chance to reach their limit, is constantly getting yelled at and wondering what all the crazy is about. It's a permanent problem in any marriage, and without conscious compromise on both parts, it can be an argument that they will still be having 45 years later. The argument well, becomes a take. Oh, go ahead. I was going to. I was going to add, and it's also true in roommate situations. Also, we we hear it a lot from um, situations Family members. Which a parent lives. Yeah, a parent lives with a, an adult child, um, yeah. and we've we probably see equal amounts of both directions the 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 child can't stand mom's clutter or mom can't stand 
child's yeah, clutter. Yeah, vice, vice versa. Yeah, exactly. So they're having that argument <laughs> and the argument will become a tape. And as soon as any one of the two of you says a few keywords, that tape will start playing and both of them will re be replaying that argument for the 900th time. It never feels resolved and can literally take a relationship down under the futility of having that argument for the 901st time to no effective change. And the solution is conscious compromise. And that's exactly what my client Zero did. She compromised and committed time and resources to working on the problem. Even though she wasn't at her limit, she agreed to start cleaning up with my help. He agreed to accept a certain level of chaos that was above what he would really like, but was below his trigger level. And that compromise has worked well for them for the last 16 years. And, and I'm an integral <laughs> part of that compromise because I'm the extra hands that help her work on the project and keep the chaos at a lower level. I have been stopping their bomb countdown clock for 16 <laughs> years. <laughs> now, not all of you can hire and help like they did. But you can discuss and make compromise between you about how to deal with a permanent imbalance. Um, you might assign rooms to each other. You can do what you want in this room, but the chaos stays out of the public areas. Or you can each decide on a type of clutter that's triggering you and ask that this type of clutter be addressed regularly. Thinking, Think about the, mile, the mail pile versus the shoe pile. If the mail pile makes you crazy and the shoe pile makes the other person crazy, you guys can each agree to work on those particular categories actively so that neither one of you each each of your favorite irritating irritating pile is being addressed you might agree on places or areas that must stay acceptable for public viewing the dining table has to stay clear the guest half bath has to stay clean the living room has to stay clear of clutter all the time you can set levels of acceptable density you might want to keep 20 things of this th of this type of thing, but you can only keep 10 of those things as a compromise. So you, maybe you want 20 coffee mugs, <laughs> but, but it's too much clutter. And so you can keep 10 of them instead. You might each pick a hobby that can be housed in a, in a set space with no interference. And you might make matching discard levels. Like <laughs> we each have to reduce our stuff by 20 items a week or a month. But it's our choice what 20 items go out the door. These are all ways to define the, the compromise and have a conscious discussion about it and setting parameters. So, so we're just giving you examples. Come up with your own. Of course, there's a million other ways to do it. But this potential problem issue for any couple can truly be managed with conscious, discussed, and agreed upon compromise. And Client Zero is a perfect example of success at doing that. So whether I'm helping you or not, you can take the angry bird out of the situation and reach a happy medium instead. I'm assuming because the, the chat is going on that people are chiming in with things to add to my conversation. So Linda says one of the benefits of having had to rebuild our home is that it allows us to choose to handle this new season differently. We're choosing to keep our home clear and easy so we can feel happy and comfortable inviting people to visit us in our home something we haven't done much of in the last 15 years or so. Relationships over stuff for the win. Yay. <laughs> and, you know, I'm sorry that you had to have a catastrophic experience yeah. to reach this a reset point, but I'm glad you're taking advantage of the reset point. It's, you know, a silver lining that you're getting out of having had a very negative and distressing experience. And so good for you to see it that way. And, and to set some parameters around it and to try to live with it differently and take advantage of, of the opportunity that no one would have voted for, but having had it, you're trying to get something good out of it. So good for you. Yeah. Susie says, I have been trying to get rid of things in the kitchen or other joint things. My sister asked me why, am I, why I am getting rid of her things, in quote, her things in quotation marks. Mm -hmm. The things I have gotten rid of are things we don't use. She tells me to get rid of my things, which I have done. I do need to get rid of a lot more, but I'm working on it. This is so the hard part about throwing out stuff that belong that uh, somebody else feels like they have ownership of. It's a situation where you definitely want to have conversation with them before you decide to let it go. 
enroll them in the decision making process. And at first she's going to be resistant. I'm guessing resistant because she's feeling like you're already giving her stuff away, but um, you can't approach her a few times about stuff. And Hey, I wouldn't do a whole bunch. Like I, oh, we got to get rid of all this kitchen stuff. No, no, no. Take one thing and say to her, is it okay for me to let this go? It's my perception that we don't use this at all. And it's taking up space. Is there a reason why you think we need to keep it? And if they say yes and give you a reason, then you need to hold on to it and and honor what they're asking. Um, but I would keep at it with other things and, t and one at a time and without that level of like you don't want to give her attitude or judgment about it. If you wanted to enroll in the process, then I think it's important to ask permission and get permission before you let something go. And if you don't get permission, don't let it go. Recognize that the first things that you ask her about are going to be, she's going to be resistant to. So things that you really think need to go, I wouldn't start with those. <laughs> start with something that it's okay for you to keep because she's going to want to keep in, in the beginning until she feels more comfortable and feels like you're asking her opinion and honoring her opinion. And then she'll, uh, I think, loosen up a little bit and be more willing to not be as reactionary about it. You also have to make the case for why it's kitchen stuff that needs to go as opposed to something else she may see as your, how you're contributing to the problem. Mm. You know, um, in other words, I think you have to make your, make the case that these kitchen cabinets are overstuffed and it's making it hard to put things away when we empty the dishwasher. It's making it hard to find the thing you need to prepare a meal. Yeah. I mean, a, a you can appeal to her logically, especially if she's if she has a hand in the cooking and upkeep of the kitchen. But you also you're suggesting something else here too, which I think is important. Um, the idea that you ask her what she thinks needs to be gotten rid of. Ask her where she feels like there's stuff to get rid of, and you're not paying attention to that. So let her suggest. I think you need to get rid of all this stuff over here, and and then go and focus on what she feels like is ready to go so that you're working in an area that she already feels like has a potential for things to leave. And you acknowledge and work on what she feels like is a problem as well. And that way you're participating in the process and she's participating in the process by focusing on the stuff that she finds useless, taking up space does isn't necessary. And so you guys can work on that a little bit and, and maybe that helps you reach a compromise between you. Yeah. Uh, Sue said suggestion, put them in a box and put them in her room. Oh yes. Okay. So I get that, but, but that, uh, that creates chaos in a big hurry. Right. Uh, Cause it won't, it won't just be a few things that then you'll sort of like be passive aggressively stuffing things into her room. which is <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not really going to get the reaction that you want in the long term. Um, I, I mean, I see why you would go there. I would say that if it's very specifically their thing and um, you wish that it was housed somewhere else, that you can ask them about that and ask if it's okay to put it in your room. This is yours. Um, I would rather it not be out in the living room. Are you okay with me putting it in your bedroom? And, you know, instead of I'm going to throw it out because I don't want it here, you can say, I, I I recognize that you, this is your thing. I'm going to give it to you to keep. Is it okay for me to put it in here? Or can I put it in this closet or whatever? Enroll them in the conversation about where it's supposed to go. Connie says, it is so much easier to notice what the other one doesn't need, right? Right. A hundred percent. One hundred percent. Which is why it's good to have those conversations because while you think it's super easy and why didn't she just get rid of that stuff when, you know, she starts talking about the stuff that she thinks she should get rid of, yeah. you may have a little bit of experience yourself about what that's like. So it's a good well, experience to have and share with each other. And you can, you know, you can, uh, it, it's useful in negotiation to acknowledge when the other person is right. You can say, yes, yes, I have too many boxes of books but they're in my bedroom and a more pressing problem is I can't make a meal because we have all these appliances on the counter that we don't use. So right. 
Beth says, communication is important. I have gotten rid of things that I did not want to part with because I wanted to please my mate, only to find out later that he had not been bothered by those particular things. Oh. There were other things bothering him that did not even occur to me. So communication is very important. Right, it's very super important. You can't assume what they're wigged about. <laughs> Never I, and, assume you, you correctly understand what the other person is pissed off about right now. Right? Or, ev or even that they are pissed off, you know. You, <laughs> exactly. You, they may be having, you know, indigestion from the sandwich they had at lunch and you're reading it as they're mad about the papers on the dining room table. And if you and if you give the assumption that you're already feeling bad about it, you're already um, you already have your own mental uh, dialogue going about what this says about you and who you are because the house is a wreck that you might be ascribing um, some of those feelings to your partner that and, and it's really just you in your head making that happen, making that association. I will tell you that I had a client who had an engineer husband and three kids, two boys and a girl house was always chaotic. There was always stuff everywhere. And they had a huge like farmhouse style, long dining table with bench, some, you know, seats and some bench seats that everybody sat at. That table always had a million things on it. Cause it was like the huge work surface in the house. It was always covered. And the one thing that bothered the husband was that the chairs were not Oh, aligned right, right, under right. the table when he came home it wasn't the stuff on the top what made him crazy was that the chairs weren't weren't sitting correctly under the table such an easy fix she could make him completely <laughs> happy and not have to clear anything off the top of the table as long as the chairs were underneath and so i think you really have to ask what is bothering you what makes you crazy and having that you know i'll, I'll work on this thing that's making you crazy if you'll work on that thing that's making me crazy and everybody's working on something and they're working on, it goes a long way to work on the stuff that's really annoying you the most to figuring, to asking what, what is really making you crazy and addressing that. And like the person said, you will be surprised what it is that bothers the person. You really will be completely shocked. You think it's this and it will really be something in a completely different room and totally unrelated to what you thought. So Working on what is making them annoyed the most will go a long way to improving your um, cohabitation for sure. Deborah says, my roommate is a cat. He really does not pick up his toys at the end of the day, but he's quite happy to drag them out of his basket overnight. So I trip on them before morning coffee in the dark. So rude. That's such a cat thing to do. Here's my clutter. Deal with it. <laughs> I, I don't think this is really a clutter story, but my my dog did something incredibly adorable the other day. We, we were, it was, uh, uh, it was a nice evening. And so Jaime was sitting out on the, on the deck with the, the doors, with the back door open and the next door neighbor dog came wandering over and she just, she wandered up onto the deck and she walked into our house oh. and our dog is not at all aggressive. So he just, hopped down off the couch and said hello to her but then she she headed into the into our bedroom and hardy went in after her and he came out a moment later with his rawhide chew <laughs> i'm happy for you to visit but As i'm not sure say, in the rawhide <laughs> yeah it's nice of you to stop by but stay the hell away from my chew <laughs> So Jaime and I were like, okay, we need to revise the list of things that we grab if we ever have to leave the house in a big hurry. <laughs> it and must so include now, the ride shoes. <laughs> now it's my laptop, Jaime's Ninten Nintendo Switch, and Hardy's Rawhide Chew. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, y'all are so funny. <laughs> Oh, and before anyone says don't give your dog rawhide, it's not actually rawhide. It's the stuff that they sell in lieu of rawhide that's safer for dogs. I can't remember what right. it's, but you know. It's a chewy thing. It's a, it's chewy. a chewy thing. Yeah. Right. He has to have his <laughs> chewy. That's so funny. Ginger I says, saw... once you get rid of something that belongs to someone else without their approval, you damage trust. They grab on tighter th to things as a defense. Better to have a shared vision about the space. That is so true. And I'll tell you that a lot of people that I work with call me and they, as I'm working with them, they're telling me stories about when their mom threw stuff away, when their right. um, 
their parent got rid of something without asking them, like they went to school and they came home and stuff was missing and how traumatizing they were. And, and the irony of uh, somebody who's 45 standing there telling me about their mom throwing away their stuffies when they were a little kid is that's how long that kind of stuff stays and how violating it feels to a kid to have stuff, um, gotten rid of without their permission yeah or and well so, or, or even adult uh, even an adult because it it sort of signals it can signal disrespect mm. it can signal oh you don't know me as well as i thought you knew me or you would know how important that thing was to me right 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 which is a little which is a little that's describing a little bit too much um understanding to somebody like like we were just talking about you never know what's going to be the thing that triggers them and so um, this is why it's important to ask and to find out, do I have permission? What's important to you? What isn't important to you? Because you'll be surprised what it turns out to be. You think you know, but you really don't. <laughs> it's completely different than you think. Um, I'm going to share uh, one from Ginger. This isn't particularly relationship related, but Ginger is a regular participant who's super organized has you know makes lots of lists and and inventories things and That's you know true. really gives a lot of careful consideration and ginger says i couldn't come up with one or two touchstone items i have a, a list of sentimental items too many i've written about them and took pictures of them save those to a private album on facebook this week i decided to let go of a small embroidered pillow a wedding gift from coworkers 30 plus years ago I like the sentiment embroidered on it, but it never went with our decor. The two coworkers moved away and have since passed away. I was dusting and asked myself, why am I keeping this? I think because I've had it so long. So out it went. Good job. It sounds like it evolved for you. That's great. And it's okay. I mean, you can think of it as you had, it had a season in your life and you cared for it and you honored the fact that they gave it to you. And, um, but you recognize that it doesn't go with your decor and it was okay to now let it go on. The, everything has a season. And if, you, if it's reached the end of its season, it's okay to surrender it, even though it's still good in air quotes and it still, you know, works and it still functions like it's supposed to. Yeah. Yeah. But if you don't love it, it doesn't have to stay. That's the bottom line. And so good job for figuring that out and um and reducing your sentimental collection uh sue says i am respectful of throwing my son's stuff out but if i were working on throwing stuff out i'm the pack rat i am sure i would be less respectful of my husband's stuff i struggle with that yeah you know here's the thing about somebody that you uh, are in love with uh they are the person who is your safe space they're the person that feels like they will love you despite any bad behavior <laughs> Right, so, which sounds a little like taking them for granted. Right, like, you know, it, it is the person that you trust the most and feel um, the most um, seen by. And so it also it creates this sensation of um, I can I can do stuff that I wouldn't do with strangers. You know, it's like you wouldn't, behavior that you wouldn't let yourself do with someone you didn't know very well you do let yourself do with someone that you do know well. And so yeah. recognizing that tendency <laughs> and uh, yeah, going, yeah, I can't really, I need to respect um, my partner's stuff as well and use the protocols that I would use for a stranger about their things. Um, it will make that person feel more respected if you treat them like you would treat a stranger. Then you guys can have a conversation about everybody working on their own stuff. But if, if you're a pack rat... <laughs> And you're working on your stuff. It sounds like you got plenty to work on. And if you get to something that is his or yours, then you might try instead of just giving it away and or not thinking about it too hard, you might try having a conversation with him and see if you can't um, work to improve your relationship around this and, and let it be something that you talk about and compromise about. Just thought. <laughs> I'll share one more comment and then we need to move mm -hmm. along. Okay. Um, Susie, who was talking about her sister, um, said, I think I just need to get rid of my extra stuff so that the house looks cleaner. Maybe she will see the advantage in having the place less cluttered. 
And it wouldn't great, be the first time that I've heard point. that. Yeah, you you need to you need to model the change that you'd like in the other in the other person. And 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 getting rid of your own stuff is definitely going to improve your situation, right? Like you're going to reduce the volume and it's going to look better. So um, focusing on your stuff first and making a dent uh, might create some, you know, or decluttering by remote control. Like I have definitely seen other people be triggered to start working by watching their um, spouse, partner, cohabitator, uh, working on their own stuff. Like once you start making some movement around it and you move the energy around it, other people get on the bandwagon. And if they get on the bandwagon just from watching you, all the better. That's great. So give it a shot and see if it works. In the meantime, you're making progress on your own space. And if it triggers her to join on the team, excellent. Okay. I'm going to come back to you for a final thought in a moment, but let's talk about next week. Um, several people have suggested spring cleaning as a topic, and with spring just a month away, that that sounds like a good place for us to go next week. So okay. watch your watch your email for an announcement. That's uh, the Tuesday, February twentieth at the usual time, noon U.S. Central Time. And give me your final thought. My final thought around this is always that there is a there is a path forward. Even though whoever you're sharing space with, you guys don't agree on what's the worst. There is a compromise to be made. There is a path to be, uh, to follow, to make everybody more happy in their space and working on that and improving that is only to the good for how you guys relate to each other. And if that, if you're the person living alone and the, the benefit is that your house is better so that you can have friends over, that you can improve your social life. That's also more to the better, right? Yeah, we, all need, we all need uh, relationships in our lives to enrich our experience. Well, at least one person told us a story in the survey about you know, turning down an invitation to go spend mm -hmm. a weekend with friends because she'd let everything pile up. She had too much to do on the weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a result too. Yeah, and you know, it, this is this is how clutter interferes with your quality of life. So, think of it as addressing your quality of life, whether you are have a relationship happening inside the house or whether you're talking about relationships outside of your house. Uh, all of those things are improved by uh, making the clutter not be a deterrent to you uh, having friends and fun and love in your life. And so, we want to aim for that. Hopefully this can help you. Why don't you give us the tittle? This week's tittle, nurture relationship. <laughs> this week's assignment is to work towards improving relationship that suffered as a result of clutter. Reflect on a way in which stuff has adversely affected a relationship in your life. For example, the condition of your home has created conflict with your spouse, partner, or living companion. Clutter and mess have prevented you from hosting guests or has caused you to isolate yourself from your friends. The state of your stuff has damaged your relationship with yourself. That is with your own goals, wishes, desires, needs, and dreams. Brainstorm a few actions you might take to improve the situation you reflected on above and make a commitment to tackle the first item on your list this week. So we want you to get in motion around something that will affect your uh, relationships where clutter has interfered with your relationships and come back and tell us how it goes. Okay. If you're watching this on YouTube, we would love for you to join us live to get notifications about upcoming events. We invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook or subscribe to our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from you, so please keep your questions, comments, and topic suggestions coming in the in on YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere that you find us. You can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. We always enjoy you so much. We're so glad that you came to listen to us talk. I hope that you'll be back next week when we'll be talking about spring cleaning. <laughs> Perennial. Everybody gets to spring, and they come out of cold weather, and it's time to start tearing the house up. So. Let's use that energy and fuel some change for each other. Well, and we're, we're talking about it next week. And we're doing it early so that 
you can make a plan because you can make a plan and get it'll started, go, right? It'll go better if you work from a plan. Exactly. 100%. We'll see you here next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.